Greetings in the name of God the Father and Christ the Son, and in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Welcome to this worship and service of the First Presbyterian Church in Mount Pleasant, Texas. I'm John Coleman, your liturgist on this third Sunday of Easter. So good morning, and it is so glorious to be with you this morning to see your masked faces. <laughs> Every six feet or so here, right here in this sanctuary. What a privilege it is to be able to gather together to worship. To praise God and hear his word proclaimed in person. And we've been doing this now for a couple of weeks. And so we want to welcome visitors that we are having as well. So if you're visiting with us this morning in Wood, we'd ask you to take one of those little purple cards from the rack on the back of the pew in front of you and just give us your name so we can have a record of your attendance this morning. Now, offering plates still not being passed in the service to try to reduce as much contact as possible, but they are just outside of the two doors. And so if you would not only drop your, uh, your guest attendance information in the plate, but for our members, uh, your offerings as well. To you who are watching this on Monday or Tuesday or whatever day from wherever you are on Facebook or our YouTube channel, uh, we hope you're doing well. And that for all here and there, remember the services are being recorded and put on the church's Facebook and YouTube pages for anyone and everyone to watch at your convenience. We're so thankful that you've been patient and been careful observing the recommended safety measures, getting the vaccines as we wait, and hopefully soon our small groups and gatherings uh, will be back meeting here as well. A couple of announcements on this third Sunday of Easter. It's a busy day in the life of the church. Uh, in the service, in the worship service, there will be a very quick congregational meeting, election, and installation of the class of 2023 elders. Uh, the members of that class to be presented and elected are, and they're all here uh, this morning, John Wilhite, Pat Burke, Nancy Beatty, and Paul Merriweather. Uh, after worship, those people having been duly elected and installed, the session will meet here in the sanctuary. Uh, Mark will not be with us next Sunday. He will be out of town. I will be filling our pulpit. Uh, and so there will be a uh, Bible study Wednesday night at 6 o'clock by Zoom. The scripture will be John 10, verses 11 through 18, which is the passage of Jesus talking about being the good shepherd. So John 10, verses 11 through 18 will be the scripture for the Zoom Bible study on Wednesday night. Zoom Sunday school again next Sunday at 9 a.m. as well. Birthdays of this week include Joe Boggs on Monday, Wednesday is Linda Duros, Dalton Taylors, and Lydia Webbs. Thursday it's Becky Merriweather and Bob Karkoska. Saturday is Annalisa Boggs' birthday, Sunday is Tanner Gerhardt's day. Those are our announcements and calendar items as we have them. You have an insert in your bulletin you may want to refer to as well. But having done that much and said welcome, let's prepare our hearts and minds now for worship.
none of us can escape the collective guilt that allows innocent people to suffer. By our neglect, if not by deliberate intent, we bear some responsibility. Let us repent, therefore, and turn to God so that our sins may be wiped away. O oh God, we are disturbed and distressed by the evil that surrounds us. It's hard to view people we see as your children, murderers, abusers, those who cheat others and profit at their expense. Sometimes we feel like victims and wonder why we should confess our sin when there is so much evil beyond our influence. Yet we know we do not abide in your love. We sin by turning away from others who are beloved by you because they are different from us. We do not always abide in your love. We need your forgiveness too. Seek your mercy and healing. Save us and forgive us in Jesus' name. Amen. And now having confessed as a community of faith together, let us now confess individually in silence. Repent and seek new life in Christ, receive God's forgiveness. Hear the good news. Beloved, we are accepted by God, whose will for us is joyous freedom in Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I declare that our sins are forgiven. Amen. standing there with them, there was nothing that they could say. 
So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him? You be the judge. The gospel lesson is found in the gospel of Luke, 24th chapter, beginning in verse 36b. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. So he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do your doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. And he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. <coughs> This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> this morning we continue uh, our look into the epistle of First John. Uh, this intimate and uh, important epistle that is written and shared with this church. Uh, it's important for us during this Easter tide season uh, to know how this early church was reacting to and hearing the message about the resurrection and what Jesus' resurrection and, and our life and that means. Uh, last week I reminded you that we will be hearing a few things um, every week, and I want to remind you of that again. Uh, we're going to be hearing often about the call to love one another and to give that love freely to those who need that love. We're also going to be uh, hearing how important it is for the children of God to avoid sin. And I'm always reminded when I hear that of uh, an old, an old joke, I don't know if it's true or not, uh, about Calvin Coolidge who left church one day and uh, Mr. Coolidge was uh, a person of few words, they say, and uh, they asked him as he was leaving uh, the church, Mr. President, what was the sermon about? And he said it was about sin. And they said, what did they have to say about it? And he said, the preacher was against it. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, 1 John will remind us that it's important for the children of God to avoid sin. It's also important for us to remember that the intimacy of this epistle that is written uh, largely deals with division and faction within the church. That there were false teachers who had arisen already in this early church, and they were attempting to divide the church, and they were attempting to uh, create uh, stress within the church. And we're going to hear some language in the scripture that we read that's a little bit troublesome to our ears. Uh, I, I don't want you to personalize that. I want you to hear that 
in the context of this writer is telling the people in, this con in these congregations, if you are dividing the church, if you are fighting against what the church is doing, um, you, are, you are sinning. You are not being a child of God, which is what God has called us to do. And so it's important for us to keep that in context when we, uh, when we hear uh, part of the uh, text that will be read today. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the gift of your word. It is from your holy word, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we are reminded and that we are brought into the presence of your grace, your mercy, your providential care, and your love. And so it is with thanksgiving that we read and hear and proclaim this word, knowing that your spirit will be at work. Our prayer is that you would silence in us every voice except your own, that by hearing we believe and that by believing we are your servants. Through Jesus Christ, who is the risen Lord. Amen. From the epistle of 1 John, chapter 3, our reading today begins at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When He is revealed, we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is, and all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born of God do not sin because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin because they have been born of God. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do not do what is right are not from God, nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers, and you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need? and yet refuses to help. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Thank you. Martha and Harold never missed a chance. It was
was like they knew what to do without any thought or prompting. No matter what happened in the life of their church, they seemed to be a step or two ahead of everyone. Not that they thought about any of the work they did as a competition, and for that matter, no one else in the congregation did either. It was just Harold and Martha doing what Harold and Martha always did. If there was a death, Harold might run over to the house of the family and mow their yard because that might be something that was needed and the family might not have time to do that. Martha might gather up a supply of paper plates and towels and napkins and cups so no one would have to worry about washing dishes in the coming days. And, and one time when they knew a family that would have a lot of people coming in from out of town coming to stay, Martha and Harold took their car and their son's truck over and just left them there with the keys in so there would be plenty of vehicles for everyone to drive just in case. Now the mistake could have been made that Harold and Martha were trying to earn their way into something. Most popular people in the church. We are volunteer of the year in the city. Or maybe find their way into heaven through their works. But it wasn't any of those things, especially the latter. Harold and Martha were creatures of grace. Grace that had saved them. But grace had not stopped with their salvation. Grace had taken them to a deeper understanding that was needed in all circumstances and needed by all people. And that deeper understanding was practical, down-to-earth love. No matter what they did, when people would try to heap praise on them by specifically talking about their actions, one of them would say, we don't know what you're talking about. What we did was just love. It was just love. Chances are that we all know someone like Martha and Harold. Maybe someone in this congregation. Maybe someone from work. Someone who lives in our neighborhood that makes the best coconut cake. Or the casserole. We can't quite put our finger on why it's so good, but when it arrives, we can't resist getting more than one serving because what we do know is the main ingredient in that is love. And in those painful, difficult moments that those folks come to us, and they gift us with their presence and their love. It lets us know we are part of a larger community. That we belong to a family deeper and broader than the roots and limbs of our family tree. And while we are thankful for their coming to us in our time of need, somehow we are even more thankful that we know they will go to anyone with that love and give of themselves. We are thankful that they have grown beyond themselves and live for the community. And there's that word. Community. We're going to hear it a lot. And rightly so because in the faith community, there is no escaping it. And life without it is less than what life should be. More and more, it seems that the biblical story, especially where conversations with or about Jesus is concerned, that story is about the creation and the continuation of a community whose purpose is to cover all of God's people in grace and acceptance and mercy and dignity. This created community is built on the foundation of holy love 
And it has at its center God's presence in the world in Jesus. And Jesus' self-giving holy love calls us to a radical reinterpretation of family. One that recognizes as essential the responsibility that all of us as members of the community have to give practical, authentic love to everyone who crosses our paths because we are God's children called to love others as God has already loved us. And this love sets us at odds every now and then, sometimes even within the Christian community. Where it has been the message of preachers and teachers and churches who have spent the majority of their time and their money and their energy and well-intentioned methods and programs and even some chicanery trying to get people to claim Jesus' name for the sole purpose of avoiding hell and gaining heaven. The writer of 1 John refuses to fall into that category of heaven or hell exhorters. Oh, you just heard what we read, so don't make any mistake. The writer isn't shy when it comes to talking about and using evocative words that we in the church often avoid. We just said a mouthful of them not long ago. Sin, the devil, darkness, evil, hate. The writer knows, sees the destruction brought about by the effects of sin and evil and the devil and darkness and hate. But the response of the writer to what is seen and experienced is far greater than the simple possibility of an individual damnation. Rather, it is the fact that these powers at work in us dismantle the community created by Jesus, the same community of which we are a part and we are to continue. And for the writer, there's only one way to stop the dismantling of this community. Love. Only love. The holy love of God shown to us in Jesus at work in us to provide the real help needed to those that we need. Food for those who are hungry. Clothes for those who are naked. A place for those who don't have one. Companionship for the lonely. Healing for the hurting. Only love can break the deadly cycle of events that corrode the foundations of the community. Only love, down to earth, practical love, protects the community, helps the community, and identifies the community, and makes it possible for the children of God to be who we are and who we are yet to become. The writer used these words. We know love by this that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Or as we are used to hearing almost every Sunday that we are gathered, love is the gift that binds everything together in perfect harmony. And the community, our community, is where God's love abides. One Ash Wednesday, a hospital chaplain slipped away from the hospital long enough to attend the midday service. And so he returned to work a bit later with a cross-shaped smudge of ash on his forehead. 
At one point, he entered the room of an older woman who was a patient, and she immediately reached over and grabbed a Kleenex and said, Come over here, dear. You seem to have gotten into something. She was clearly getting ready to clean up his dirty forehead. No, no, the chaplain said. You see, this smudge of ash is from an Ash Wednesday service where I was reminded that I am part of a human community loved by God. I was told that I am weak and frail, sinful and vulnerable, and that someday my own life will return to the dust. But I was also told that these ashes in the shape of a cross mean I am a part of a community created by God and gifted to the world in Jesus because Jesus gave himself up for everyone and has made life new and makes all of us into one family. And all of that takes place because Jesus loved the world and everyone in it. That's the community Jesus created. A community of love where we are called to help take care of each other. Well, the old woman listened, thought for a minute before she spoke. Before she spoke and then she said, I think I would like to be a part of that community. I want some ashes. And so the chaplain took his finger and not having any ashes on him, borrowed from his own crossed smudged ashes on his own forehead and made the sign of the cross on hers. The old woman smiled and the community continued. It is in the community where God's love abides. That's where genuine love exists through a willingness to act out, giving what we have received to someone else who needs it, sometimes in ways that seem <coughs> contrary to the way the world gives out things. But that's okay. The writer of 1 John says, if you love like that, it's how the world will know that you're following Jesus. And it's how the world will come to know God and the love of Jesus. But love is the key, the foundation. Without it, eventually, Everything would fall apart. But with it, anything can endure and even flourish. And living a life based on that kind of love is hard, but it's simple, it's complex. But it isn't complicated. Because the love Jesus showed us and gave to us is down to earth and practical and real. And we know it when we have experienced it. And we know it when we see it. And we know when we have it to give to others. And it's good to talk about it. Good to tell others about it. But it's even better when we put that love into action. Like Jesus put into action. Giving. Sharing. Healing. Tending to and caring for others. Action tells the tale about how deeply God's love has transformed us. And our relationship with God through believing in the love gifted to the world in Jesus 
sets the path for how all of our relationships will unfold. And those relationships are meant to play out in love and with love for the good of all. <coughs> to give life in the community. <coughs> Where God's love abides. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Having heard the word of God proclaimed and spent just a moment reflecting on how that lives out in our lives, would you please stand and let us together affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. COVID has changed a great many things that we have done or not done in the church. Uh, one of those is not being able to be together for so long. Uh, we were unable to hold the congregational meeting to actually elect our elders that were nominated uh, back in December and so we're going to convene a congregational meeting right now to elect those elders and then move in uh, to the installation of those elders uh, so that they will be able to fully participate in uh, today's session meeting and all the upcoming uh, meetings and ministries and governance of the church. So I will declare that our congregational meeting is open for the purpose of electing elders. The nominating committee has put forward the names of Nancy Beatty, Pat Burke, Paul Merriweather, and John Wilhite, uh, all to serve uh, three-year terms, so they are the class of 2023. Uh, are there other nominations from the board? Is that motion seconded? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? That motion carries. Nominations have ceased. And I would hear a motion to uh, elect uh, by acclamation Nancy Beatty, Pat Burke, Paul Merriweather, and John Willock. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. And Nancy and Pat and Paul and John are duly elected by this congregation to serve as elders in the class of 2023. I would like to uh, say a prayer right now to uh, close our congregational meeting and 
uh, at the conclusion of that prayer, I would ask John and Paul and Nancy and Pat uh, to come forward and kind of space themselves out around the, uh, along the front here and facing the congregation. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, God, for the gift of the church and for all activities that we are able to do in the name of Christ for the building up of the kingdom not the least of which is the election of elders. And so we thank you, God, for the call that has gone out and the call that has been accepted and for this congregation's response to that call and to that acceptance. And we offer this prayer in the name of Christ, who is the Lord. Amen. But John and Paul and Pat and Nancy would come up. Just uh, space yourselves out and face the congregation to... Uh, Continue with the spacing. I'm going to do my part from up here instead of coming down like I normally would. Uh, there are some uh, readings that I will do, and then I have only one question to ask of all four, since all four are previously ordained and uh, will be installed with the asking and answering of that one question. Uh, and then there are a couple of questions I will be asking of the congregation as well. There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your Son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and gave us cleansing and rebirth. We praise you for pouring out your Holy Spirit who touches us and leads us into all truth, filling us with the variety of gifts that we might proclaim the gospel to all nations and serve you as a royal priesthood. We rejoice that you have claimed us in our baptism and anointed us for service in Christ's name, and that by your grace we are born anew. By your Holy Spirit, renew us that we may be empowered to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all glory and honor now and forever. Amen. Nancy and Pat and Paul and John, I have one question to ask you, and you all can answer that by simply responding, I will. Will you be a faithful ruling elder watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service, and will you share in government and discipline? Serving in councils of the church and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? I would like to ask the congregation to stand. There are two questions I will ask of you, and your response, uh, should you choose, is we do. Do we, the members of the church, Accept Nancy, Pat, Paul, and John as ruling elders chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. And do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray again. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. Throughout the ages and in every place, you have chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation by your grace. 
We are grateful for ancestors in the faith who followed without fear, placing their trust in you alone. For judges and monarchs who ruled in righteousness and peace, for prophets and apostles who spoke your bold words of mercy and of truth, for leaders and teachers in every age who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all he said and did. Gracious God, we also give you thanks for your servants, Nancy Bailey, Pat Burke, Paul Merriweather, and John Wilhite. As they continue in the ministry to which you have called them, help them to rely on the gifts of your spirit and to follow Christ faithfully in this calling. By the gifts of your Holy Spirit, empower them to build up the church to strengthen the common life of your people and to lead with compassion and vision. Pour out your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church that we may be for you a holy people baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain your church in ministry, ground us in the gospel, secure our hope in Christ, strengthen our service to the outcast, and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together that we may be effective servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Nancy and Pat and Paul and John, you are ruling elders, ordained and installed to ministries of service and governance in the church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. I charge you to show us the way by leading a life of example, an example of love. Love as God has already loved you freely and without condition. Showing us all that love is that gift that binds everything together in perfect harmony. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon you all as you Give us servant leadership, now and always. Amen. You may be seated. and your love are evident in our living. We are thankful for your presence among us, for all of the ways in which you show us your love and your grace and your mercy. Particularly, we are thankful for the ways in which we have seen that love and grace and mercy in the person of Jesus who has come and lived among us full of grace and truth and has shown us the way of life and love. By the power of your Holy Spirit at work in us, bring us to deeper levels of commitment and service to Jesus' way that we may proclaim with our words and deeds the good news of Jesus' kingdom. We are thankful for the responsibilities that your spirit calls us to live up to. One of those responsibilities is to be diligent and faithful in our prayers for those of our community and beyond. We pray for your blessings upon Annalisa Boggs and Darlene Davis, on Emily's sister Nancy and her brother Duane. We pray for your healing and for your presence with Joe Butler and Marty Graves. 
and for Emmalina. And we ask your blessings upon the children on the border. And God, we pray for your presence and your peace with the mass shootings that are taking place in our country. Heal those who are wounded. Comfort those who are grieved. Show those who are killing and hurting your peace and your grace and mercy that they may come to love life. And God, we give you thanks for the opportunity we have had this morning to install new elders unto the session of this church. May your grace be with all elders who are serving but especially this day with Nancy and Pat and Paul and John. Embrace them. Encourage them. Fill them with the compassion and the love of your Holy Spirit. Mostly, God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ who offers us hope in all things, in whom we have deep and abiding faith, And who has taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And we have smiled into temptation.